In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Once in a while I have an experience where I hear a word, and it's a normal word, it's a common word, and yet all of a sudden I hear it and it sounds strange. Some of you remember that comedy routine uh, about the word obey. You might remember that. Well, the word that sounded strange to me all of a sudden was the word enough. I was listening to myself. By the way, everybody, I'm over here. How are we doing? They're doing, they're taking care of what they need to do. Thank you. Um, the word enough. Enough is a strange word because it looks strange, sounds strange, enough. And when I heard myself say it, it was one of those moments of just like, why does this word sound strange? But it was good because it's an important word for us to think about. It's strange because we also use it in really different ways, sometimes different than what it really means. If somebody is bothering you, you might say to them, that's enough. What you really mean is, that's too much. It was enough before, and they kept going, and now you say that's enough. So what is enough is often, what we say is enough is actually too much. But you know, sometimes in a positive way we can say that's enough, meaning it's too much. Recently, we took uh, the effort as a community, and we said com as a community, that's enough to our mortgage. We had paid interest on that mortgage for 20 years, over $2 million in interest. And finally one day we said, that's enough. And as a community, we decided to get rid of our mortgage, thanks to all of your love and generosity. So enough is a, can be a very positive word if we say that's enough at the right time. Sometimes, however, we can say enough at the wrong time. Maybe like me, you have heard of this growing fourth wave of COVID going through Michigan. And maybe like me, you said, enough already. <clears throat> One wave is enough, two waves is enough, three, now a fourth wave. Wondering what this is going to mean in terms of the health of the people that we love and what it's going to mean for our convenience or inconvenience. And so we say perhaps, only to ourselves, or maybe we say it out loud, enough. And that's where you can see as an example of how enough can be a very dangerous word. If we were to all say, you know, we've had enough with coronavirus restrictions, heck with it all, we could inadvertently spread disease to some people that it wouldn't be very good for. So our leaders say to us, don't say the word enough because it isn't yet enough. We still have this pandemic raging on. And as important as that would be as an example, there's an even more important area of our lives that we really have to be careful that we don't say enough or say it too early. And that is our spiritual efforts. You know, we're going through entering now, tomorrow we start the fifth week of Lent. In some ways, we've talked to how it can go really fast. In other ways, it's like, when are we going to have enough lentils? I actually said that to my wife two nights ago. I said, what's for dinner? She said, lentil soup. I said, I'm a little bit lenteled out. <laughs> Had enough of the lentils. And you know, when we say enough, but it's the wrong time, even more dangerous than in the middle of a pandemic, doing that with our uh, restrictions and precautions. In the spiritual life, the stakes are even higher when we say enough. Because what we say is enough really may not be enough. The danger is that what we feel is enough is really only what we want to be enough. And because we feel like it's enough, we say it's enough, it doesn't mean that it's enough. All it means is we feel it because we don't want to do it anymore. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily the right time to say enough and to stop. And as a crystal clear example, what we heard 
in this morning's gospel. The disciples had said enough too soon. In the gospel, a man brings his son to Jesus. In the most desperate situation any of us can think of, when our children are suffering, nothing worse, worse in the whole world than when our children suffer. It's hard to see parents suffer. It's hard to see our peers suffer. But when we see kids suffer, and our own children, perhaps there's nothing worse in the world. And this desperate man brought his son to Jesus. Only it wasn't the first time he had tried to bring his son to Jesus. He had brought his son before, and the disciples stepped in. The man had gone to the disciples first and said, My son has this terrible demon. It takes him, it throws him sometimes into the fire, sometimes into the water. Imagine that, that you couldn't control your own child who may inadvertently throw themselves into a situation where they're burned or they're drowned. Horrific. And the disciples, when they saw this boy, they did something. I don't know what they did. I'm guessing that they prayed. What we do know is whatever they did wasn't enough. That the boy was not freed of the demon. And so the man brings his son to Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Long before he turns to address this horrible situation, he turns to the disciples with very challenging words that none of us want to hear said to us by anyone, let alone the Son of God. But Jesus turns to the disciples and he says, How long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? On the one hand, a very awful thing to hear out of the mouth of Jesus. But the disciples heard it that day. You see, they thought that whatever they were doing was enough. And at the time, after Jesus heals the boy and gets rid of the demon, the disciples come back. It's where the story ends, or almost ends, in today's reading. Jesus says, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer and fasting. Now, you and I hear that with check boxes. Prayer, done that, check. Fasting, probably did a little bit of that, check. Jesus is not talking about check boxes. He's talking about the kind of faith that we come to only when we pray and fast, and then fast and pray, and pray and fast, and fast and pray. You see, fasting in its essence is not just giving up a food here and there. It's not just eating a lot of lentils. It's turning away from what we depend upon and taking everything that's in us and depending only on God. And when he says prayer and fasting, he's not saying check, check. He's saying the kind of fervency, the kind of faith that only comes with prayer and fasting as one combined action that we turn to God with everything that we have and everything that we are. You see, Jesus was scolding the disciples. Why? Because they should have been able to get rid of that demon. And because long before they prayed and fasted enough, they said, enough! Maybe they went to the temple one time that week, or the synagogue, or said a psalm. And it's not as significant as what they did that was the problem. The significance for that young boy was they did what they did, and then they said, enough, and they stopped. And that's the challenge to you and I today. Whether we are wearied from four weeks of prayer and fasting, that according to the church still isn't enough, two more weeks to go until we get to Holy Week, and that's a challenge all its own, or whether we have disregarded the fast to this point, or somewhere in between, or whether or not what we're talking about enough is not just our spiritual disciplines, 
or at least the kind of prayer and fasting. Maybe it's where prayer and fasting are supposed to lead us, which is the giving of mercy to the people around us, whoever they may be, the people that we know, especially ones that we really struggle to show mercy to, or the folks that we have no idea anything about them other than they need mercy. The hungry, the poor, the homeless, the lonely. So what's significant is that all of us have said enough too soon. If that doesn't strike you as being realistic for you, let me open for you the book that we honor today as we honor St. John of the Ladder. This is his book. I have, I think every year I've been a priest, quoted from the ladder. I've never gone past step three of the 30 steps. I've never mentioned anything past step three because for us, the first three are so hard. I've said, well, let's work on the first three. But well, today I'm going to do, I think for the first time, quote from another step. We'll go as far as step four. Listen to what St. John says in step four in his 30 steps that lead us to the kingdom of heaven. He says, obedience is absolutely renunciation of our own life, clearly expressed in bodily actions. Or conversely, obedience is the mortification of the limbs while the mind remains alive. Obedience is unquestioning movement, voluntary death, a life free of curiosity, carefree danger, unprepared defense before God, fearlessness of death, a safe voyage. How many of us can say that we obey anyone like that? I don't. I'm working on it. Not enough. And the fact is that all of us have to do more just to get to step four with 26 steps to go after that. And why haven't we done it? Not because we don't think it's a good idea. Not because we don't from time to time think about our own eternal salvation or lack thereof. Life gets in the way, and compared to everything else that's right in front of our faces, it's too easy to say, well, that's enough. I did this, and that's enough. And as I said before, here's the danger. When we say enough before it's enough, now what are we saying no to? We're saying no to the next step God has put in front of us. When we say enough, we mark our own path and we say when we stop. And then we miss where God is leading us on the next step and the one after that and the one after that. You know, some of us are saying enough because we're wearied with the fast. Night after night of services, <coughs> night after night of lentils and other foods that we're tired of. But for others of us, Maybe some of you haven't been to even one Lenten service. Maybe you haven't fasted at all or fasted just a little bit. And you know, we could mis mistakenly think, well, we've got kind of two groups in our church. You've got one group that's here all the time and they're working hard and they just keep going and they keep going. And you've got the other group that, well, they just, they just come Sunday morning. My brothers and sisters, we are not two groups in this community. We all have one thing in common, that all of us have said to God, enough. That's enough. It's enough. Maybe we think we're saying it to ourselves when we really are saying it to God. Whether that enough came before even one Lenten service or whether it came after the 25th, we get to a moment and we say enough and the danger is the same. What's the danger? That it's God who leads that next step. That when we say enough, we're not stopping the step that we necessarily think is the right step. That's what we do when we say enough and we stop. Saying enough says, I'm not going to take God's next step for me. 
And that's what happens when we say enough. We stop listening to God. And we take a path that really, literally, goes nowhere. When we don't say enough, we keep moving. And we might feel weak, we might feel we can't handle it. And what do we find out when we don't say enough, we keep moving? That we had more strength than we knew. We could do more than we thought we could. And if we're smart, then we say to ourselves, wow, look what God was able to do even in me. Hopefully we don't say, oh, look how good I'm fasting. I thought I wasn't as good. I'm better than I thought. Hopefully we're not that stump, that stupid or dumb. Hopefully we give credit to where credit is due. That when we turn to God for his strength and he gives it, we recognize it. And then we don't make the mistake, hopefully, of saying, okay, well, that was enough then. We take the next step to see where God is leading us. And you know what? Even if we're not going to take the next step, the worst mistake in the world is to say enough. And it's enough. And decide for ourselves. But if we're not going to take the step, at least you know what we can do? We can go, I'm not doing it now but I know God wants me to, and I know with his strength, I could. Then that door stays open just a little bit that the next time we get to that point, we might actually open the door and keep going. Rather than closing the door ourselves, the door that God himself opens, and not recognize that he's done so. So how do we do it? How do we get to that point of feeling so tired, Fatigue, whether it's fasting or services or loving people. Because we get to say that point too, too often. We say, I've done enough for them. Let them take the next step. How often we've said that. What do we do? We pray. And we pray, we pray the prayer that we heard, which I think is one of the most beautiful and important prayers in all of the Bible. See, the Bible has some very important and powerful prayers. This is, I would put it in the top three or four of the entire scriptures. When the man said to Jesus, if you can heal my son, Jesus turned it back on the man. And the Greek shows us a little more clearly than we see it in the English. He says, if you can. Jesus says this to the man. Not if I can, if you can, Jesus says. And he follows that by explaining, all things are possible to him who believes. Meaning him who trusts. She who says, God, I'm, on, I'm relying on you. You can do this. I trust you to do this even through me. And then the man utters this beautiful, important prayer. He says, Lord... I believe. Help my unbelief. Sounds like a contradiction. How can we believe and not believe? Because that's who we are. Every single one of us, that's who we are. We believe and we don't believe. How do we know? Because we all, whether they're at different points or not, it doesn't matter, we've all said to God, enough. We believed, we believed, we believed, and we said, and that's enough. But this man invites us to pray with him to take those steps of belief. And instead of saying enough, say, Lord, help my unbelief. That's what's stopping that next step. It's not God's lack of giving us power. It's our unwillingness to receive it. When we pray to God, Lord, help my unbelief, guess what? He's going to help. And then it's back to us. Having asked for God's help, asking for help even with our own unbelief, will we take that strength he gives us for that next step? Or will we go back to unbelief? If we ask for God's help, we're going to receive it. And we're going to believe more than we do now. That's how it works. You pray, and you pray hard. Pray hard with fasting. 
you'll get what you're asking for if that's what God wants for you. And then we need to let God to decide when it's enough. We need to decide it for ourselves way too long and way too many times. We can let God decide when enough is enough. When it is enough prayer, enough fasting, enough loving people. Let him decide. What's for us to do? Believe. Act. And we get to that point where we're tempted to say, enough, that's enough. Ask God to help with our unbelief. And when we ask for that help, he's going to give it to us. If we keep pushing through our fatigue, we're going to see what God can do, even through us. And God can do miracles through us. Let me close with one more important point. All of this is not learning how to not say enough because God wants something from us. You've heard me say this before, and I'm going to keep saying it. It's not about what God wants from us. When we're tempted to say enough, that's our mentality. What more can he want? Enough is enough. When we say enough to God, we're stopping what God wants, not from us, but God wants for us. Are you perfect in your faith? Are you perfect in your love? Are you perfect in every way? Then you have no need to worry about whether saying enough is enough. But if you're like me, you're not perfect, which means God has more of a work to do within us. Not because he wants more just from us, he wants more for us. And yes, by the way, for ourselves, but also for the other. Because we live in a world where all sorts of people are suffering in all kinds of ways, from all kinds of demons. Not just the kind of demon that throws a child down on the ground or into water or fire. My brothers and sisters, God is not looking for things from us. He's looking for things for us. That we can join with him and he can perfect us. To find the perfection within ourselves that he wants for us. And yes, for the others that need it too. May we stop saying enough to God. And open our ears and our eyes and our minds and our hearts. And find what he wants for us beyond our own refusal and our own enough. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.